We have the chant on the Brahma Viharas, particularly the chant on goodwill, to make the mind expansive. It's good to think of all beings several times a day with goodwill. Like that character in the through the looking glass. He said he liked to think about two or three impossible things before breakfast every day. Open up his mind. We open up our minds as we think of all beings. And try to bring that same expansive attitude to the breath. Too often we talk about paying attention to the breath. We say, focus on the breath, and we instinctively tense up around whatever we're focused on. It makes it uncomfortable. So instead, think of the breath bathing your body. It's on all sides. It's in the front, it's behind, it's to the left, to the right. You're sitting in the middle, surrounded by comfortable breathing. And listen to the body. This is an important aspect of trying to bring some control to the breath. You listen to it first. What feels good? Would deep breathing feel good? You can try it for a while. How about shallow breathing? Try that for a while. Fast, slow, heavy, light. Experiment and listen. The Buddha once said that the Dharma is found through commitment and reflection. And commitment means that you really give yourself to it, but then you have to reflect. This is an important part of developing any skill. All too often we're impatient. We try to barge right in, bring some control, and the body reacts in a negative way. And then we decide that control must be bad. Think about that image the Buddha had about the difference between the right path and the wrong path. He compared it to different ways of trying to get milk out of the cow. If you try twisting the horn, you're not going to get any milk, and the cow doesn't like it. You try twisting harder and harder and harder, and you still don't get any milk. And then you relax. You stop twisting the cow's horn. You feel a lot better. And then you decide, okay, effort is bad. Control is bad. The problem is you still don't get any milk. And the cow does have milk to give. In the same way as we deal with our aggregates, form, feelings, perceptions, thought fabrications, consciousness. There are unskillful ways of trying to control them, and there are skillful ways. You can actually turn them into the path. Like all five aggregates are involved in concentration. Form, of course, would be the breath. Think of the breath going through the whole body. Feeling would be the sense of ease you're trying to develop. Perceptions would be the images you hold in mind about where the breath is running in the body. Thought fabrication is you try to adjust things and observe. The Buddha calls it directed thought and evaluation. You bring your thoughts to the breath. You notice how it's going. You try different ways of breathing, and then you decide which ones feel best. Then consciousness is aware of all these things. So there are all five aggregates. If you cling to them in the wrong way, they're going to cause suffering. If you cling to them in the right way, they become part of the path. Because the nature of the aggregates is there are some things you can control, some aspects to them you can't control, and others you can't. Because you're dealing with things coming in from your past karma. These are the potentials that you can try to develop here in the present moment. But past karma doesn't cover everything. You're also making some choices right now. 
As the Buddha says, you fabricate form, these potentials for form, feeling, etc., for the sake of something, and then you have the actual experience of the aggregates. So there's already an intentional element in your aggregates. It's just that you and everybody else tends to be ignorant of this. As we meditate, we're trying to become more conscious of what we're actually contributing here in the present moment and how we can change that contribution to something positive. Now, sometimes the aggregates resist, after all. The potentials come from our past karma, and we may have to deal with some negative things that resist going the way we want in the present moment. But we're not going to find that out unless, unless we try to make some changes. If we couldn't make these changes, then there would be no path. As the Buddha said, if people couldn't change their behavior, there would have been no reason for them to teach. Actually, there would have been nothing to teach to begin with. But it's because people can abandon unskillful habits. They can stop twisting the cow's horn and develop skillful habits. They can actually pull the udder and get the milk. That's why it's worthwhile for him to teach. It's also why it's worthwhile for us to practice. There's a tendency sometimes to say, well, I, I've tried to control things and it's just not going well. Maybe I should give up. But actually the aggregates have some room in them for you to make a difference. And you're not going to find out about it unless you try. And so this willingness to Try things out, and if they don't work out, try things out in a different way. And if that doesn't work out, try things out in a different way. Think of the Buddha's determination when he was still a young prince to find the way to awakening. He tried many different paths. Then when he found that the path that he was on wasn't working, he'd try something else. When that wasn't working, he'd try something else. He kept at it. Well, it's good to have the same determination in our own practice. Try to notice what works, what doesn't work. And if things are not working well, what can you change? Because after all, we are here to put an end to our suffering. And if you just give up, you say, well, I'll, I'll content myself with what someone once called the third and a half noble truth. But you don't try to bring suffering to an end, but you try to manage it. But the Buddha was not the kind of person to content himself with that approach. And we shouldn't content ourselves either when the end of suffering is possible. So be willing to engage in trial and error for a while, but always be observant. It's your willingness to listen. You stop, look, and listen, and you learn. Try something out. If it doesn't work, I'll try something else. And this ability to listen. Well, think about listening to another person. If you just barge in with your ideas of how that other person should be, they begin to shut up. They don't share things with you because you're pushing them too hard. But if you're willing to listen, they open up and then you can understand them better. It's in the same way with the breath. Ask the body, what would feel good right now? Where would it feel good for the breath to come in? This is where it's good to expand your imagination. We have certain cartoon ideas of what we should feel as the breath comes in and where, the, where it comes in, which muscles in the body are going to be doing the work. And when we sit here very consciously focusing on the breath, we're focusing through the lens of that cartoon idea, and we can get ourselves pretty tired. So use your imagination. Where else could, what else could the breath do? And John Lee has you think about the breath coming in and out of the body in different spots. Give that a try. 
just hold in mind the thought that wherever there's pain or tension, okay, the breath is coming in right there and dissolving that tension away. Hold that picture in mind and see how the body responds. Or maybe focusing right at that spot is not going to help. So ask yourself, well, what other spot is connected to that? Years back when I was young, I had migraines, and I found out that a lot of the migraines were associated with tension in the lower back. So I'd focus on the breath coming in and out through the lower back. And that would help it relieve things. When I had malaria, I found that my breathing got labored because the parasites were shredding up the red blood cells. Oxygen wasn't getting to the muscles that were doing all the work. And the image I had in mind of where the breath had to come in was causing certain muscles to do all the work, and other muscles were just relaxing. So I thought of the breath coming in through the middle of the forehead, down from the crown of the head, in from the back of the neck. Just held that image in mind. And different muscles started to do the work, other muscles were able to relax. So make use of the power of perception. That will shape some of the intentions that you bring as you're trying to take the potentials of the aggregates and turn them into a state of concentration. Because otherwise, what do we do? We take the aggregates and we cling to them in a way that turns them into suffering. We don't like them, we try to throw them away. Well, it doesn't work. We keep coming back to them. This in that chant we had just now, the Dharma summaries. They come from a sutta where a king is quizzing a monk on why he ordained. And the monk explains, and he talks about, basically it comes down to aging, illness, and death, inconstancy, stress, not self. And the king admits that all these things are true. But then at the very end, the monk says, suppose someone who had come from the East and say, there's a kingdom to the East that you could conquer. There's lots of wealth. Would you go for it? And here the king, who's 80 years old, has been made to reflect on his own weakness that comes from aging, the fact that illness is beyond his control. In fact, when he dies, whatever he has, he's going to have to give up. He's been thinking about this, and immediately he says, yes, of course. And that's why the summary is that the world is insatiable, it's a slave to craving. If we give up on trying to shape the aggregates in a skillful way, and say, well, just I'll be done with them, let go of them. But if you haven't really completed the path, you can't get out, and you, so you come right back. Just like the king who's willing to come back. and go for it all over again. So there are skills to develop, and it's important that we learn the patience and persistence that are required to develop skills. Think of some skill you've developed, either in terms of music or cooking, carpentry, any manual skill. And ask yourself, to what extent was I able to control that? To what extent was it beyond my control? And how did you work around the things that were beyond your control so you could get the results you wanted? Well, it's, meditation is the same sort of thing. There is that instant, you may call it cloning awakening, we say, well, I'll, I'll be like an awakened person with no desires. Just be receptive to whatever comes up. Well, to get there requires a lot of work. You can't clone it. But you do the you do the work, and you learn from doing the work. And that's how the path develops, and that's how you get genuine results. You pull the udder, and the milk comes out. So 
So there's a lot to learn in, about control as you practice. Think about it, John Lee's observation that when you're getting the mind in concentration, you're going against the three, three characteristics. You're taking this mind, which is in constant, and you're trying to make it constant in its focus. Which means giving it a focus that it feels good about, a focus that's expansive. Think of the hunters going through the forest. They're looking for tracks. And they can't just focus on one spot. They have to have what they call scatter vision, where they're aware of the entire range of their visual field. It's an intense focus, but it's broad. That's precisely the kind of focus that feels good inside as you meditate. So as you provide a focus that feels good, okay, you're taking things that are inconstant and stressful and you're turning them into something more constant, easeful. Taking things that are not self and you're learning to influence them so they can become part of the path. There will come a point where you realize that you can take it only so far, but it's far enough to get into a good state of concentration. It's far enough to become part of the path, to deliver you to where you want to go. So there's no quick and easy answer to how much control, but you learn from pushing here, pushing there. Some things allow you to push them, other things will resist. But you're not going to know which is which unless you push. And notice the results that you get. This is why people long ago stopped twisting cow horns to get milk. And it's common knowledge you now that you pull the udder. In the same way, the Buddha found the path through his efforts, and he taught it. He made it very clear. Now there are people who want a, a one-factor path or a two-factor path. One-fold or two-fold, just awareness, or just this or just that. But as the Buddha noticed, it's a skill. It's a little bit more complex than that. But it's not so complex that we can't master it. 